Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Carrie Burke, your moderator for today's webinar, the A's, B's, and four C's of testing cloud native applications. You may send in questions at any time during the presentation via the chat feature. We will collect these and address them at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Dan Cornell, a globally recognized application security expert who holds over 15 years of experience architecting, developing, and securing web-based software systems. As Chief Technology Officer and Principal at Denim Group, he leads the technology team to help Fortune 500 companies and government organizations integrate security throughout the development process. Howdy, everybody. And uh, today we are coming at you live from Blanco, Texas, where I'm tethered in over a cell phone connection. So clearly there's nothing that could go wrong with that setup. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for taking time out today to uh, you know, spend this uh, roughly lunch time with, uh, with everyone. Hope everybody is staying safe and healthy out there. Uh, and today we're gonna be talking about the, uh, the, the A's, B's, and four C's of testing cloud native applications. And so looking at some of the changes we've seen uh, you know, as, as we do assessments of applications, as we look at how organizations are building applications, uh, you know, to move from a more traditional monolithic model to a more modern cloud native model, uh, some of the changes that we've had to go through in our assessment practices, um, you know, as well as some of the changes in thinking that organizations have had to go through, again, looking at the security associated with these cloud native applications. Uh, so a little bit about me, that is a picture of me uh, with a pre-pandemic haircut. Uh, fun fact: I wasn't wearing uh, wasn't wearing pants in that uh, in, in that situation, but I, but I am wearing pants uh, today. So, not a requirement for you guys listening, but I uh, just wanted to class it up for everyone. Uh, but I'm I'm the founder and CTO of Denim Group, uh, and I'm a software developer by background. A lot of uh, Java server early server side Java in the mid to late '90s. Um, in the early uh, 2000s, did some uh, some .NET work, uh, but really for probably the past 15 years, my focus has been helping organizations deal with the risk associated with the software that they are developing. Uh, and I'm a software developer by background, uh, and so that informs a lot of the perspective I have, uh, for better or for worse. But uh, I'm, I'm a person, a software developer that has come into the world of security as opposed to someone with a more traditional maybe systems administration or network pen testing background that is now looking at web and mobile applications. But I've found that background to be very helpful working with organizations as they have evolved their development practices from you know, some of the more earlier web development practices to the more modern cloud native development that we're seeing in you know, organizations today. Um, a little bit about Denim Group. Uh, again, we uh, work with organizations to help them build resilient software uh, and software security programs, both with our services as well as our ThreadFix platform. Um, and agenda-wise, uh, I want to contrast between what we've seen in application development uh, you know, tr traditionally. Again, in my, in my background of about 20 years, um, what we've seen over time and some of the changes that we've seen in the last probably five years really accelerating in the last two years. Uh, so the good old days versus the more interesting new days. Uh, I'm going to talk about this concept of an architectural bill of materials. And so you know, maybe some of y'all are familiar with the concept of a software bill of materials. And so I'll talk about how I think that needs to be expanded uh, in the world of cloud native development. And then I'll talk through just from a you know, mnemonic standpoint, the four C's that we see or that I, I think of when looking at the security for cloud native applications. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some reporting concerns, uh, like how to, you know, how you need to shift in these more complicated cloud native environments, how you maybe need to adjust the way that you report on the vulnerabilities and risks. Uh, and I'll talk about tailoring assessment priorities to meet your needs. You know, as, as we'll see in a cloud native environment, there are, not an infinite, but there is there, there are a large number of things that you could be concerned about and a large set of activities you could use to, you know, to be doing your testing. In, in, in the real world, you're not going to have the resources inside your organization, the budget to procure outside resources, right? You've got to focus in on what matters. And so I'll talk a little bit about some, uh, some techniques that we've used to prioritize the uh, assessment uh, activities so that you get the most security insight for the unit of resources that you expend. Uh, and as Carrie said, please uh, share questions and, uh, and, and and we'll answer those at the end. 
so the good old days, this is, a, this is a threat model of an application in the good old days, is monolithic web applications. You have the users out there, uh, you know, outside of your firewall, those are potential bad guys. Uh, you've got one big you know, blob of code that is doing something valuable and it's talking to a database. How you do an assessment? You know, take the code and you know, blast it with static or dynamic analysis, you know, stuff it through uh, Fortifier check marks, uh, you know, hose it down with uh, app scan or web inspect. Uh, maybe you do some manual testing, and, and then you, uh, you know, generate a nice PDF, uh, you know, preferably with a uh, you know, colored pie graph on the front of it, uh, and, and hand that over. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's there's a, a lot of a lot a lot of things I have to say about reporting formats that are a little bit beyond the score uh, the scope of what we have time to talk about today, but they're also worth looking into. But let's now move forward to the more interesting new days. And so this is a, uh, a diagram. I've been working with some technologies that auto generate threat models. Uh, I plugged it into our ThreadFix platform just because it's a large, uh, you know, complex application that connects to a lot of stuff. And, and what it does is it looks for all these various connections uh, and then draws you a little bit of a data flow diagram of where it sees uh, communications going on. And uh, so, so I was, I was looking at this, and it was I, I, everything I saw I expected to see, except I noticed that for a particular piece of functionality that you can turn on in ThreadFix, uh, it makes some calls out to some cloud uh, assets. Um, and uh, this is a known thing. I knew it should be calling cloud assets, but I found that it was calling uh, some, some some things beyond what I expected. Um, you know, I'm fairly involved, so I, it was surprising to me to find that out. Uh, so I went and talked to the architect, and he said, oh, no, we had this problem with uh, the volume of data we were trying to move, and so we did this and this and this, and so that's why we're, that construct is included. made total sense, but for me, it really drove home. When you look at these applications that are developed using modern technologies, it's really easy to get sprawl of attack surface that you don't know about. Um, and so that is something that I think we've seen as characteristic of these more modern applications. Is the attack surface gets a lot more complicated because you're looking at uh, more types of building blocks than you could use before. Uh, here's another example of, a, of an interesting application. We were doing some work with an entertainment and media website. Um, and, uh, you know, and they had, you know, most of it was hosted at uh, AWS. You know, they had their web front end, uh, a couple different services that talked to, uh, you know, Aurora and S3 for data storage. Um, and what we also found out through discussion is, number one, they were using a hosted MongoDB provider that was out in the ether somewhere that nobody knew a lot about. So that's scary. I'm glad, I'm glad we identified it so that we can talk about it. Uh, and we also found that they were using a dedicated server at Rackspace. And so we're taking notes, uh, you know, talking to these folks, and they're like, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and the chat runs on a dedicated server at Rackspace. We're right, cloud server at Rackspace. And they said, no, a dedicated server. Uh, and I said, dedicated server? Like with all of this architecture being so you know, cloud focused, you know, what, are these, what, are these crazy, you know, what are these crazy people doing with this uh, you know, chat server, with a, a dedicated server from Rackspace running chat? And I, and I wondered, like, what's the, what does the provisioning look like to provision, you know, to, to, to spin up a dedicated server? And I envisioned like, like at the banks, they used to have those, uh, those little uh, cylinders and you like write your order and put it in there. And it goes like, you know, down a tube and into, into, it was kind of like the reverse process of the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark where somebody in the basement gets the cylinder and it says, oh, we need a compact pro -Lion something or other. And they go and like blow the dust off a box and put it on a wheelie thing and bring it back out. And uh, I don't know, that's, that's how I envisioned, uh, presumably, uh, Rackspace is significantly more uh, sophisticated in the way that they manage their uh, DC ops. Uh, but uh, that was uh, at least a funny vision that came in my head. And, and uh, of course, so as, a, as another lesson that I learned or that I continually learn working with different organizations, in my head, I'm thinking, well, what, what are these? That's stupid that they provision this dedicated server. That doesn't make sense when everything else was so cloud friendly. Well, as has happened every time I think that something is stupid, it, it certainly may be stupid, but there's a reason for it. And the reason was that their chat software from the vendor to get a service contract and have a service level agreement, it had to be running on a bare metal server. You know, they hadn't updated their capabilities or their support to work with uh, cloud servers. And so, uh, you know, again, as security people, I think uh, you, in a lot of cases, we get brought into situations and there's an initial reaction to think, well, well, that's, you know, these people are doing something stupid. Um, Every time that I have thought that, I have actually learned, no, there were very valid reasons for why this decision was made. Um, you know, maybe we would debate and come to a different decision now, but it's not that this decision was made, uh, you know, for, for, you know, out of ignorance or idiocy. Uh, you know, every time I have thought that, um, 
you know, there has been reasoning for the decision that was made that is defensible. And so that was an interesting lesson that I took away and, you know, hopefully others can take some value away from, you know, if it's uh, stupid, but it works, then it's not stupid. So what changed uh, in application development over time? And I think it's important to step back and look at the why, right? So look, changes in the technologies that organizations use for building web applications, they don't happen so that pen testers get cool new stuff to work with and that we can continue to have like new and interesting talks at OWASP or that I continue to have your topics for, uh, for, for webinars. And there's a, a, a really valuable uh, uh, TED video out there from uh, Simon Sinek you know, talking about like, let's start with the why. And so why have these development teams evolved so radically the techniques they're using and the tools they're using to develop applications? And what it comes back to in a lot of cases is this concept of digital transformation, which is a marketing buzzword that has been largely overused, um, but, really, um, but, but, but really captures at least a lot of the reasoning that we're seeing at the executive level of why these changes are coming into place. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and so, as I said, like you know, pen testers, these changes aren't happening so that you have like cool new stuff to learn, uh, although that is a side benefit of it. Uh, for in-house folks trying to run AppSec programs, these changes aren't happening because God hates you and doesn't want you to be happy. Um, you know, these are happening for a reason. And so, you know, when, when I talk about digital transformation, the thing that really captured, you can have all these kind of floofy explanations of it, but John Dixon really distilled it when he talked about two travel experiences he had. And he talked in one case about an organization that, uh, or, or, or a situation where he had a flight, uh, you know, flew. Uh, when he landed, he got a text from the rental car company telling him, hey, your car is in this location, whatever. Uh, you know, he went, you know, took the bus to the rental car company, got into the car, drove to the exit, showed his, uh, you know, uh, you know showed his uh, license and, and left, right? You know, for frequent travelers, hopefully this is a common experience that you have. Well, he contrasted that with another trip he had also taken recently where he flew in, landed, you know, got no notification after landing went to the rental car company, different rental car company, and, you know, had to go to the desk and they mess around and they're like, oh, okay, well, here's your car. Well, you know, we're going to go, uh, you know, show you where your car is. And they're like, oh, wait, we can't give you that car because this system over here is telling me that the license plate has expired. We've got to go back to the top of the process and start this all over again while we find you another car that has the, um, you yeah, know, that, that has a valid license plate, right? So it, 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 if you contrast the customer experiences there, very different. So in the first organization, they had integrated technologies across trading partners, like the airline and the rental car company were working together to provide a valuable uh, you know, experience, customer experience to the customer, and contrast that with the second situation where not only were the trading partners or these partners in providing this experience not working together, but within that organization, they had their information systems were siloed such that they couldn't even, with their part of the experience, they couldn't even deliver it well there. And so that is, when I think about digital transformation, it's uh, you know, that, 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 that those two anecdotes really boil down a lot of the challenges that we see. And when you, also when we think as a security professional, like taking a step back and looking at the CEO level, the risk that we in InfoSec talk about is crap a lot of times, right? We're worried about, you know, obviously nobody likes to have their customers' information uh, exposed, you know, you regulatory fines, you, you know, negative brand uh, impact, all of that. But falling behind creates an existential risk for firms, right? If you're not able to delight customers, uh, especially in comparison to your, you know, to, to your so-called peer organizations, you're going to fall behind, right? Nobody wants to be the last CEO of Kodak that said, okay, we've got a couple patents that we can sell off, but we totally miss this, you know, in this case, very specifically named digital photography, right? You don't want to be, you know, as, as a CEO, of course, it keeps you up at night. Customer data, uh, you know, hackers on your systems, malware, uh, you know, in, in some muted form should make it up to the CEO and should cause concern and drive uh, you know, behavior to address those risks. But the real true risk for organizations is an existential risk if you're not able to evolve and provide value to your stakeholders. Um, and so what, what does this mean? 
it means as an organization, you've got to be able to go faster, right? You need to be able to iterate more quickly, get ideas out to market more quickly. Uh, and so the answer everyone has for this, uh, you know, because uh, airline magazines probably and, uh, and, and books by Gene Kim is, okay, well, we need to change our culture to be a DevOps culture, right? We need to break down the barriers between the uh, development teams and the operations teams. Uh, that's going to let us go faster, iterate more quickly, uh, and drive innovation out to the marketplace faster. Cool. You've changed your culture to DevOps. Well, you're probably also then adopting technologies to support this mission. Right. Um, and so on the one side, you're changing architecture. So instead of these monolithic architectures, here's a whole bunch of code. It talks to a database or two, and it's an application that does one set of things for the customer uh, or for a set of stakeholders. You move to microservices architecture. So you take your application, you break it up into pieces so that you can, with these microservices, combine those in different ways and do more interesting things, right? Because you've got a smaller set of building blocks that can be combined in different ways for different stakeholders. We also see that the technology adopted uh, is going to change. And so in order to support these changes, you're going to start you know, using cloud servers instead of Rackspace dedicated servers, unless you're running chat. Uh, you know, you're going to be using cloud services. You're going to move to containers. You, you may adopt serverless. And you're going to be using CI, CD pipelines for your development teams uh, to quickly validate and make determinations if you can push new changes or if, if new builds of software are acceptable to push into production. Right? So a lot of changes, and, and, and these changes are happening, again, because they provide value. They allow these DevOps teams to do things, work faster, scale more easily, do more with less. Um, as a side note about microservices, uh, again, that's viewed architecturally as a panacea, and certainly there are great things that go along with microservices. But if you couldn't make one big thing work properly, what makes you think that you can make 30 smaller things that need to talk to one another work properly, right? So that is one thing to be wary of, certainly. I think the perception in a lot of cases is that uh, you know, microservices work uh, one big, you know, smiling, happy family, all for one and one for all. Uh, how microservices actually work is uh, more like uh, you, know, you get this sprawl of microservices, and it's uh, you know, kind of the, you know, the, the 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 hipster millennials and the uncles with the MAGA hats, and the you know, like it, it, it's uh, it can be a challenging transition to work with and get all of these things to work productively together. So that's certainly something to uh, certainly something to be aware of as you're engaging on these transformation initiatives. So that brings us to just to kind of some mnemonics for thinking about these changes. The, and I, I call them the A's, B's, and four C's of, uh, of uh, you know, securing cloud native applications. Uh, if I could have come up with a Sun Tzu quote is the title of this, I certainly would have, but I couldn't come up with anything. So instead we've got A's, B's, and four C's is our mnemonic. And the first part of this is an architectural bill of materials. What are all the pieces that go into this application and how do they fit together? Uh, and then looking at the four C's for each of those pieces. What code did you write that is going to do valuable stuff? What components have you included with that code to allow it to you know, do important stuff? Uh, from a compute standpoint, where is it running and how? Uh, and what is your cloud configuration that is surrounding this that is also having a security impact on the system? Uh, so maybe, it's, maybe it should be five Cs, but we're going with four for the moment. So starting, uh, you know, starting out, Let's look at this concept of a software bill of materials, and, and that's a, an important question. It's really been pushed by uh, like Josh Corman and other folks that are working in the public policy space of, you know, for an application that I'm running, what all is in that software? And so just like a bill of materials for a lawnmower or whatever, you know, roller skate cart or whatever that thing is, uh, you know, hey, show me all the different components. How many do I have? And uh, you know, and how are they fit together in here? So I know what are all the pieces I have in this particular piece of software. And, and in the case of software, this typically means open source. What are the open source components and the versions in this uh, application that I'm using? Uh, and Steve Springett maintains an excellent OWASP, a like flagship OWASP project called Dependency Track that is all about how do I track the software bill of materials for all the applications that we're building in our organization. I really recommend folks take a look and check that out. Because that is a very important concern, especially when we see like the Equifax breach, other breaches like that, that are based on uh, vulnerable open source components. Uh, this concept of a software bill of materials is really, really valuable, uh, you know, just in general from a sanity standpoint, but also from a risk management standpoint. And again, I've seen a tremendous amount of interest in that from the government 
space. Uh, you know, that's the type of thing that can be legislated if you ship software, uh, include that. And so that's an idea that has, uh, I think, some traction in the government space, uh, but also a lot of it as well, increasingly uh, with the commercial organizations that we're working with. Uh, what is in all the software? You know, what are all, what are all the stuff that's actually in the software that we're uh, working with? So let's expand on that and look at and, and look more broadly about an architectural bill of materials, right? And uh, you know, so, what are we, uh, you know, what are we talking about here? And it's really what are all the pieces of the system that we're looking at, right? When we look at these cloud native applications that have microservices potentially running in containers and multiple environments, you know, maybe they talk to outside components, front end applications, all of this, right? Instead of having one big ball of code to worry about, now you have multiple balls of code to worry about that are deployed and running in different environments, right? As I said, we're going to have more pieces in these cloud native applications and the types of pieces that are available uh, also, uh, you know, also have greatly expanded. And so what you want to be able to answer about the system is, you know, what are the various parts of the system? Uh, you know, what do those parts consist of? What are they doing? Where are they hosted? And also, you know, what are they talking to? Like in the absence of this, you are flying blind. You don't know what the attack surface of the application is. You can't craft a sensible testing plan uh, and so on. You're really starting from the bottom. Uh, you're, 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 you're flying blind because you just don't have, uh, you don't have even the base level of understanding. And so again, from a blind pen test standpoint, you can certainly start shipping away and working at that. But if you're looking at in your organization, the applications you're building, you don't necessarily want to start from a blind perspective, right? You want to get the most security insight per unit of resources applied. Uh, and so that's where having an architectural bill of materials becomes very important. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I was you know, kind of bouncing this idea off of some folks, what they came back with was, well, you know, so it's a threat model. Yeah, pretty much it's a threat model. It's at least about the first half of a threat model um, because you want to know what are there, all the different parts of the system and how do they communicate with one another? And what's a great way to do that? It's to build a data flow diagram so that you know all of the assets in the system and how they communicate with one another. Um, we don't have time to go through a full uh, threat modeling brief, although that is something that we may, uh, you know, if, if people are interested, we can certainly do that as well, uh, possibly on another one of these uh, webinars. Um, but at a high level, you need to decide on scope, right? What is in scope and what is out of scope for the system that we're trying to threat model? Then we build our data flow diagrams. And I, I personally like uh, you know, the Jordan DeMarco style data flow diagrams. Um, you know, Pre-UML, uh, so old school. Uh, you know, other, other organizations and other uh, folks even in, in our organization have you know, kind of mod modified some of this as well. Uh, but really what you want to know is, you know, what are the assets and how do they talk to one another? And that gets you your architectural bill of materials. The last two steps in threat modeling where you enumerate threats and decide on the mitigations, uh, you're also going to need to do uh, in order to characterize the risks and the vulnerabilities that you identify. Uh, but from just a pure architectural bill of materials standpoint, uh, those first two steps are really the critical things. And so, again, uh, I, I personally like the your DeMarco style stuff. You know, what are the external interactors outside of the scope? Uh, what are the processes that we're running? What are the data stores? And how does data flow between them? And where do I consider my trust boundaries to be? Uh, from there, you know, and here's an example, we've got a web application, again, kind of an old school web application. It's got users that are making requests, getting responses. It's got some sort of a web service that it's talking to with responses. It's got a database that it's reading and writing data from, and then it's also writing out logs to and, you know, Elk or something like that. Um, you know, pretty basic, uh, you know, pre pretty basic uh, application example. Um, and then also, uh, you know, one way to look at this is uh, the concept of stride, the acronym of stride. Uh, yeah, it's kind of an expansion of the CIA triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so we look here at uh, you know, spoofing identity, uh, tampering with data, repudiation, or the ability to say that you did or didn't participate in a transaction, uh, or really the ability to prove that someone participated or did not participate in a transaction, uh, information disclosure, uh, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. And the nice thing about Stride combined with those data flow diagrams is certain threats or certain risks really uh, apply to certain asset types. And so if you've got an external interactor, you're concerned that someone might spoof and act as if they were that external interactor. Uh, and from a repudiation standpoint, you're concerned that you might participate in a transaction with them um, or, or, or not and, and have them assert the opposite. Uh, you know, processes are susceptible to all of these issues, whereas data flow, really what you're concerned about with data flow is, is somebody going to tamper with the data while it's in flight? 
Uh, is someone going to observe or get access to the data while it's in flight? You know, or is someone going to make it so that we you know, don't have service, so that we can't communicate across the boundary that we need? Uh, and so this is a fairly mechanical uh, process to you know, take all of our assets, uh, associate threat types with each asset, uh, and then voila, you get a set of things that you need to worry about. Uh, pretty pretty straightforward and, and mechanical. Um, you know, and again, so the arc, for the architectural bill of materials, steps one and step two are really what we need. Uh, but there's also value in finishing this off because we're going to need that later when we try to provide context for reporting. Again, when you get to these cloud native applications, um, you know, it's not as straightforward as saying, you know, hey, I found a SQL injection or a cross-site scripting, and that's you know, everybody kind of knows what's going on with that, or hopefully people know what's going on about that. Uh, but if you're saying, hey, this particular container doesn't have a password, well, how worried do I need to be about that, right? Or, or hey, this microservice has failures in authentication or a lack of authorization checks. Well, how concerned do I need to be worried about that, right? Knowing about the, the you know, the from a full threat model standpoint can help provide context for that type of reporting. Uh, you know, now, similarly, given our architectural bill of materials, we now need to look at the security of each of those pieces in the overall system, uh, test them for security issues at the, at the various layers, and then we aggregate the results, uh, and then that flows, obviously, into reporting. So from here, we look at the you know, what I call the four C's. And again, that's code. What code are you writing that does something valuable? Components, what components do you include with your code to provide you know, frameworks or you know, utilities or things that you don't want to write yourself? Compute, where is all of this running? You know, it's got to be fed through a processor somewhere. <laughs> where, where and how is that uh, compute being run? Uh, and, then, and then finally, the cloud configuration. Again, when you deploy these cloud native applications, they live in an environment of the, this cloud where the cloud, the various cloud providers have different security features and capabilities that can be used or, or can be not used. And so the cloud configuration is again looking at the environment that you're going into and the potential configuration issues there. So first, let's look at code. And this is the code that you write. So it's your business logic and the stuff that you use to glue stuff together. And, and if you think back, again, I've had the, the, the uh, opportunity uh, you know, to participate in OAuth for a number of years, like 15 now, it's a long time. Um, and that's really been the traditional focus of OAuth and application security, right? Let, you know, people used to be concerned about holes, uh, you know, you know like, let's run Nmap and Nessus and look at the network configuration. Application security was saying, well, but you're going to poke holes in the firewall in 18443. Let's be worried about the security of the code that we're writing. And so this is where you see the more traditional set of application security tools used for testing. Let's use static analysis to feed, uh, you know, feed all this code or a binary through. Uh, it's going to do data flow, uh, semantic analysis, uh, you know, control flow analysis, whatever that might be. Uh, dynamic analysis. Let's exercise the application, send data in, see what comes out, and uh, and respond to that. Uh, or IaaS. Let's embed something in the running application and get some of the benefits of both static and dynamic testing, right? Um, but that's really uh, you know, largely the focus of those tools. Although there's, you know, with, with IaaS because it's in there, it'll bleed over into some stuff that we'll talk about later with the composition analysis and whatnot. Uh, this is also so again, the, where you typically test with manual penetration testing and code review to look for those business logic issues that the automated scanners are just powerless to find. So very traditional focus of OWASP. Uh, one side note here is great news. Um, you know, a lot of these cloud native applications uh, use significantly more APIs where they're communicating between different processes as opposed to communicating with users via browsers. Uh, and so in a lot of cases, the dynamic testing tool that you use for web application testing uh, don't necessarily work super well for APIs. And so that's something to look at uh, you know, and, and, and work with with your DAST vendor uh, is to understand what do I need to do that, you know, if, if anything, or what has to be done for me to get some level of coverage with these uh, with these DAST tools when I'm talking not via HTML and form posts, 
but I'm, instead I'm talking, you know, JSON or XML, you know, being fed over HTTP according to some kind of pattern. Um, you know, again, there's some API focused ass tools that Zap has some capabilities in this area that you know, some of the commercial folks do as well. Uh, there's always the option to do manual testing and, and there's usually some tool smithing to make that work well. Uh, but that is something that's very important to understand. If you're expecting to use DAS tools on these microservices and their APIs, uh, you need to understand, you know, is this something where you've got to feed it swagger or something so it knows how to fuzz and what the protocols need to look like. It's worth a conversation uh, to understand what's the value of, what, what value am I getting from this tool and do I need to configure and run it in a different way uh, in order to get good test coverage. Uh, now we can move on to components. Uh, and these are typically the open source components that you include so you don't have to write everything. Uh, they're you know, libraries to do, you know, to talk to databases, to email things, uh, you know, perform you know, machine learning calculations, whatever that might be, as well as your frameworks, your Spring, your Struts, your Django, uh, you know, that, that, that make it so that you don't have to write a bunch of code. Um, you know, it's it, it, interesting in the, you know, in working with ThreadFix and working with different organizations, uh, you know, they've said, well, you know, would just ThreadFix include open source? And, you know, check yes or no. I'm like, everybody's software includes open source. Of course we have, uh, you know, of course we have uh, open source in there. You know, we could talk to you about the components and the versions and what they're doing. And, and that's really what the, the questions are here. Uh, and really, I saw this software, the, the components as a security threat really gained prominence when the when the concerns about this were included with the OWASP Top 10 2013. Uh, and they certainly gained extra notoriety with the Equifax, Equifax breach. So thank you, Struts, very much. Um, you know, all of the software composition analysis vendors had to have, uh, like, you know, all their prayers and, and, and sacrifices and the whatnot. Like, uh, you know, that Equifax breach was a, uh, it was just really a, a was great, great for that particular class of tools. Um, and so you test this again, the typical way to test this is with software composition analysis, um, where, you know, you have some sort of a tool that looks, uh, at a piece of software and teases out through a variety of means, what are all the open source components and the versions that are being used here? And let's compare that against a list of known vulnerabilities in open source. Um, you know, obviously there are a bunch of, uh, you know, there, there are a bunch of commercial vendors in the space, uh, and, and, as, as well there should be. Uh, one project though that I like to promote is OWASP Dependency Check. Uh, that's uh, you know, led by Jeremy Long. Um, and it's, it's a really cool uh, open source pro uh, project uh, that uh, does this type of analysis. Uh, you know, started out in the Java world, they also you know, have plugins to shim in other sorts of analysis. Um, but to, uh, you know, and, and they make it easy to put this type of thing like in your DevOps pipeline. So uh, you know, if you're getting started in this space, uh, again, a lot of commercial vendors out there, but I certainly recommend that you take a look at OWASP Dependency Check. That's another flagship level product or a project at OWASP. Um, really fantastic stuff. Um, so now let's look at compute. Again, you know, something has to run all of this code. The code you wrote in the open source code, something's got to write, and something's got to run all this code that you've got. Uh, and this could be uh, you know, virtual machines, it could be cloud servers, it could be in containers. Uh, you know, serverless obviously takes this to the extreme. You know, there, there are still servers in serverless, you just allegedly never have to worry about them, so that's good. Uh, and, and, and obviously, based on our example, don't forget that there are still dedicated servers out there doing very important work um, for these modern applications, right? And so these servers are going to be out there you know, running somewhere. And so how do we test these? Well, this is where you test with the more traditional vulnerability scanning, the, you know, the Nessus, the Nexpos, the Qualys, uh, OpenVAS. Um, uh, you know, there's a, a number of tools that will do that where they go out, you know, scan over a network, identify hosts, identify open ports, do a checking, uh, you know, or, you know, connect via window shares and stuff like that to check batch levels and whatnot. Uh, but this traditional vulnerability scanning, uh, looking at the servers and saying what version of the software is running, how is it configured, are there any CVEs exposed or known misconfigurations being exposed. Uh, and this class of tool, this type of analysis has also been extended to containers. So for your container image, you can identify, hey, are there any like gross misconfigurations or old or bad versions of the software running on these containers? Um, <clears throat> again, uh, you're, you know, you're using either these more traditional tools or newer tools in the container security space, um, you know, in order to, uh, you know, in, in order to test the compute that is running. Uh, to identify are there known bad versions of software uh, running or known misconfigurations. 
And, and finally, we get to the cloud configuration. And this is, by my own admission, this is the squishiest of all the Cs. Maybe that's why it has two Cs. And so, you know, this is a, you know, uh, you know these are largely configuration checks uh, against the cloud environments that say, you know, your cloud environments, if it's, uh, you know, AWS, if it's uh, Azure, if it's GCP, uh, they have security features and capabilities that you can turn on uh, and, and, and configure or not turn on. And so really these, uh, you know, the concerns here are these configuration checks. Do I have open S3 buckets? Do I have bad identity and access management set up that says which of these cloud pieces can talk to one another, right? How have I constrained this cloud environment and use the capabilities of the cloud platform uh, in order to best enforce security? Um, you know, this is the type of, uh, you know, this is a, this is going to evolve over time. You know, if I was given this presentation a couple of years ago, you know, cloud servers may have fallen in this category, right? Uh, you know, m m the more stable stuff, you know, cloud servers and whatnot, you know, now gets kind of distilled out, shaken out and put into its own category. So again, as, as, as the, as cloud services become more mature and more standardized, um, you know, we'll see, uh, you know, I, I think the perspective on this is going to change and you may see classes of tools specific to certain cloud services start to evolve um, as opposed to the tooling right now is kind of looking, you know, connect to my account, look at all the you know, cloud uh, objects that are provisioned and, and, and let's look for known configuration bad things um, so that we can report on that. Right, so we've got code, we've got components, we've got compute and cloud configuration. You know, so, so what does this all look like? Uh, you know, Carrie is on mute. Uh, you know, Carrie runs our marketing. Uh, she, she has not uh, signed off on this particular diagram. She's probably gasping or sighing or crying at this right now. Uh, but a tortured metaphor way of viewing this is, uh, I, I look at this as, uh, you know, your code is a wad of silly putty. And, and, and that's a metaphor that I actually stole from Jeff Williams, uh, you know, from, from contrast is, uh, you know, he's, he's always said like, hey, code is silly putty because you can squish it around and make it look like whatever you want, right? You've got like broad latitude to stretch it and stick it on the newspaper and you know, pull it out and you know, do, do all that type of stuff. You've got a lot of control. With your components, those are more like Legos, right? How do these pieces snap together, right? I've got obviously different components that I can use, different versions of those components that have you know, potentially different security characteristics. Uh, but at the end of the day, you kind of have to snap those together while the city putty, or silly putty, you've got a lot of control over that. You know, all of this code and components need to go somewhere. So that's like a little model train engine, uh, you know, power in the system, uh, you know, whatever it means that is. And your cloud configuration are kind of the train tracks that determine you know, with switches and whatnot, where can I go? And again, hopefully you have the appropriate uh, switches turned on and turned off in your environment so that this application can't be made to go somewhere that it's not supposed to go. Um, so Carrie, my apologies for the, uh, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, diagram. Uh, I would love to talk to the outside marketing folks to see if we can distill this, you know, make this into something a little bit prettier. Uh, this, is, this is what I've got for right now. And so, yeah, so what about reporting, right? So we've looked through, we've got the architectural bill of materials, we've got uh, all these different pieces and different types of analysis can be run uh, at different levels against these pieces. And what that's going to do is that's going to dump a giant load of potential badness on you. Uh, and you need to figure out how to characterize that. So it's important to know the audience that you're reporting to. Right. Uh, you know, if you're talking to security and risk management, like that's the way that you're going to need to communicate. Right. And that's where that architectural bill of materials is very helpful to provide context. Again, I, I certainly don't want to have blank passwords on containers. Right. Like in general, if I could have a better, you know, get you know, my container locked down, I would prefer to have a lockdown container than a not lockdown container. Uh, but is having a container in a service that has been, you know, th that is like firewalled off and is a couple steps behind where it's not exposed to the outside world and the cloud configuration is such that no one can actually get to it from the open internet. You know, am I super concerned about that? Well, how do I put that in context, right? And so that's a very uh, important thing to be able to do. Similarly, you know, what if we're talking to individual service owners and developers? You know, you're still gonna have to provide some of that risk context, but you also need to provide instructions on how do you actually fix this stuff. Um, you know, and uh, how do you do, you know, when you're talking to security and risk management, you know, are you, uh, 
you know, kind of the standard, you know, what is your impact of a, uh, you know, of this being exploited versus the likelihood that that's going to happen. You know, likelihood is really, in a lot of cases, um, a, a very complicated to characterize in these complicated cloud native applications. That's where the uh, ABOM comes in, in handy. Uh, likelihood also, again, is something that uh, can, can be made more challenging. Uh, you can look at, uh, you know, Dread as well. Uh, you know, that is you know, kind of you know, falling out of favor these days, uh, you know, which is fair. Uh, and we also see industry, you know, kind of uh, gelling around CVSS version, whatever, where you've got your base metrics and your environmental metrics. Uh, again, with this, uh, a lot of the configuration around this talking about the environmental metrics that are going to impact how bad is this actually. Uh, and a lot of times this requires a little bit of narrative. Right. Hey, okay, well, if someone were to exploit this particular uh, vulnerability or risk that we've identified, you know, th this would have to happen, this would have to happen, and this would have to happen, right? And it's not unreasonable that those things could happen, but these three things would have to happen as opposed to this other vulnerability that we found here. Well, that's something that anybody from the internet can get access to. So let's prioritize these accordingly. Uh, you know, and again, you're also going to have concerns, uh, you know, such as uh, you know, does it have a compliance impact, some sort of governance impact, uh, you know, and do I have service level agreements with customers about, you know, contractually how quickly we have to address certain things uh, and, and all of that. Uh, you know, for the service owner and the, uh, or, or the developer, right, the really important thing, obviously, you have to provide context of why should they care about this or why do they have to care about this. Uh, again, getting back to you know, compliance and service level agreement stuff. But the most important thing in this case, after you characterize the risk, is well, how are they going to fix this? And that's a challenge that we see in a lot of organizations is they're moving to building uh, these cloud native applications. Uh, a lot of developers are being pushed into using cloud technologies that they're not super familiar with, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, you're, you're looking at organizations adopting technologies like you know, Kafka, like Elasticsearch, uh, you know, using serverless, using cloud servers, uh, using containers. Uh, a lot of developers aren't super familiar with these technologies. And so in cases like that, it, uh, you know, it, it's really important to be able to characterize to them, not just like, hey, you did something bad and you should feel bad about that. You can characterize like, hey, here's a risk in the system you've got. Here's context of why we think that's important. But also, here's where to go in order to address this problem. Um, <clears throat> so very, very important when reporting on these things, uh, knowing your audience and knowing how much hand-holding are they going to need or how much value can you get from providing that hand-holding to take friction out of the remediation process. Uh, another thing that is really important is tailoring testing to your requirements, right? Nobody has the resources to do everything that they want. Again, like talking about this, you know, for, uh, you know, and again, like certain organizations, we see a lot of maturity in their program and they are you know, starting to unify all this type of testing at these different levels. That's fantastic. And that's certainly the goal that uh, you know, organizations are working toward. Uh, you know, if you're really just getting started with your program of doing security testing for these cloud native applications, you know, if you're using outside consultants, um, you know, or, or standing up an internal uh, testing capability, like nobody's going to have the resources to do everything that they want, right? And if everything is important, then nothing is important. And that's something I've said, I've learned over time, and it's something that I think is really important in the context of uh, the security industry, uh, you know, if, 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 if everything is the sky is falling, then like, why do I care? Like, then the sky will always be falling because there's always going to be problems. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what we see with winning security teams in, it, it, if they can help to prioritize, this is the stuff that is important to us. Um, and like when we are working with folks about this, the kinds of questions that we ask are, you know, which services in this application are dealing with the most critical data, right? Like where's the, where are the hot spots in this application where the real value for attackers is going to be flowing around? And that's going to be one point of prioritization, you know, and which are the components in the system that are exposed the most and expose the system as a whole to the most risk? And so, you know, that's a, 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 you know, I've talked about this a little bit before. Are you more concerned that a container buried somewhere in a microservice that is firewalled off might have a blank root password or that the login routine has a cross-site scripting, like a publicly available cross-site scripting exposed, right? You're probably more concerned about that exposed cross-site scripting uh, because that is something that can be found with automation. It's on the internet. It can be exploited with automation uh, and, and, and likely will be. 
um, you know, whereas there are, there's probably a sequence of events that would be required if you're going to have some sort of badness associated with the, uh, that blank container password. Um, so you have to tailor your, just as you tailor your reporting and characterize that, you need to think like, which activities are likely to lead to reporting findings uh, that are the ones that we're going to be most concerned about? Because that's really the perspective that I've had you know, when you're looking at doing assessments and scoping assessments, right? For whatever resource you're using, uh, for every unit of that resource, you want to get the most security insight uh, for that you know, per resource expended, right? Whether that's dollars or internal to internal people's times or whatever that is. And so you know, you've got to prioritize your testing, right? And maybe, you know, certain priorities might be, hey, we're going to do dynamic testing of the public facing sites and services because that's what bad guys, most bad guys are going to have access to. Um, and, and we can use the types of tools that we expect them to use, right? Yeah, then we may want to go and look at these cloud configuration checks to ident identify potential unknown attack surface, right? We see all the time about organizations that run into trouble with open S3 buckets and things like that. And just like I had no knowledge uh, of the scope, uh, you know, in, in my example from, from, from the beginning, you know, I didn't know all the cloud constructs that we were using, uh, you know, the, the, the team did, but uh, you know, I, I you know, didn't have that insight. Uh, similarly, you want to you want to know what is our actual attack surface because the way that cloud stuff gets deployed, maybe this is deployed in a way that more people can get at stuff uh, than we would have expected. Uh, and then you prioritize additional activities based on your resources. And so if we go back to this uh, you know, this example system here, uh, web front end, a couple of microservices, um, you know, storing things in uh, yeah, S3 buckets and other Amazon databases. Uh, we've got some hosted guys over here uh, with the MongoDB, and we've got a uh, you know like a, a chat server that's a dedicated server over at Rackspace. You know, what's the attack service? Well, we definitely know about the web front end, right? And we definitely know about the chat server, and we definitely know about the MongoDB. Um, now we need to determine additional exposure, you know, right? We can scan our exposed network assets. We can check our cloud configuration to see if there's anything in there that we don't know about. Then we can make a test plan, right? Let's enumerate, uh, again, all the assets so that we have our architectural build materials. Um, and we may prioritize and say, well, let's do a cloud configuration check. You know, let's look for open S3 buckets, gross uh, access management sin, stuff like that. We're going to run a network scan of all of our exposed IPs that we own where we have uh, you know, authorization to use testing. Uh, maybe we do a dynamic scan of the web front end uh, you know, with some manual pe penetration testing layered on that as well. Uh, you know, again, because we're running the chat server, maybe we uh, you know, run a DAST or an API scan of the chat server and maybe augment that with some manual penetration testing. And that, you know, again, this may be what we would use to get a uh, you know, to get a base level view of the security of the system. Again, with a strong focus on outside in, what are the attackers going to see first? If we have more resources, then we may we may shift things around and say, well, hey, I'm going to uh, we're going to do some more uh, manual testing for that web front end of the chat server, right, to, to identify potential authorization issues that the scanner would have missed. Um, you know, and you know, because the uh, your perimeter is never as good as you think your perimeter is going to be, maybe now we want to start taking a look at the uh, API scans of the user content location services. Um, you know, because those again, maybe they get exposed somehow that we don't know about, or maybe folks find a way to proxy attacks through that web front end. Uh, we may also start looking at doing some st static testing or manual code review for the web front end and those services. Um, you know, do some network scanning from inside of your firewall. Again, you don't want to be crunchy on the outside and soft on the inside. Uh, maybe we start doing some container vulnerability scanning at the, of those container images that are running the various services. Uh, and from, you know, maybe the MongoDB hosted folks won't let us do testing, but we want to run them through our uh, you know, standard vendor security checks. You know, hey, do you guys have uh, you know, what are the security practices that you have in place? Can you fill out this Excel spreadsheet uh, questionnaire and, and get this stuff back to us? Uh, and again, so it, this is a, I mean, this is obviously high level guidance, not based, uh, you know, not, not based on any individual, any, anybody who's on here, their specific situation, um, you know, but, uh, you know, is at least a way of thinking about this, right? Where you're going to prioritize testing activities, right? If, if, if I could find everything, what would, what would be the worst thing that I would have to put in that report? Okay, good. Well, let's do the type of testing that is likely to find those issues that are going to be the worst things that we would have to put into that report. Um, that's really where you want to focus your resources. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then obviously expand from there. Um, you know, and 
uh, if you're looking more programmatically, well, hey, how do I stand up these different security practices? Well, then, you know, then you may have some different things. You know, I'm talking more from the standpoint of, hey, we have this cloud native application, and we need to do, you know, for, for the first time, we need to do an assessment. Uh, you know, if we look at setting up a program for this, that's probably worth another webinar. Uh, you know, that level of thinking might be different because then it's going to be focused on tooling and what can we get in the pipeline and how do we what needs to be synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, that may be a good topic for another day as well. Um, well, good. Well, that's a lot of a lot of stuff uh, thrown at you all really quickly, uh, and so we've got um, we've got uh, some. Or if everybody would like to send in their questions, let me pull up the Q and A um, as well as the chat. Uh, very good. Uh, okay, so first question that we're looking at here uh, is: uh, so can comprehensive cloud config check be fully automated, or some manual reviews via checklist? necessary um, so I think that the the, the automated checks uh, you know if you want to look at like Scout suite and things like that uh, you know dome 9 in the commercial space um, and there's there's some other folks as well um, uh, so yeah I, I think those are a great place to start um, but as with all of the other testing um, you, you know that, that they're a place to start um, but you're gonna have to call like manually call a lot of the results because the you know the, the vulnerabilities or the you know, configuration misses that they identify may not actually be misses, you know, depending on how your system is supposed to be configured. Um, and so there's obviously manual evaluation of that, uh, you know, and manually understanding about that architecture and, uh, you know, your, your data flow and your communication patterns, uh, you know, that is potentially going to raise other questions as well. Hey, is this traffic properly encrypted? Uh, you know, how are we doing authorization at this endpoint? You know, things that you, uh, you know, that may or may not be possible to include in, uh, in the automated checks. Uh, favorite framework for testing, uh, fr framework, uh, sorry, favorite framework for testing egregious problems in Terraform files. Uh, specifically for Terraform, I don't have a specific answer to that, but let me get, uh, let me talk to our folks uh, that uh, are a little bit closer to doing that, and I will get an answer uh, back, and we can include that in the email that goes out with this or with the kind of show notes or however we post this. So great, great question. Let me get a specific answer to that question for you from, uh, you know, from, from our team. Uh, I see a lot of issues of instant method data being accessible on virtual machines hosting um, uh, web apps. Um, we do see some of those problems where you can see, uh, where you can identify, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you identify, you know, again, uh, on, on the virtual machines, being able to fingerprint those, being able to fingerprint different um, uh, you know, di different frameworks and things like that in place where you get this bleed of, uh, of, of metadata that you would, uh, you know, that you would want to, that you would not necessarily want in there. Uh, some of that type of stuff we see, with, you, you can catch with some of the automated frameworks uh, where they will, uh, where they'll pick that up. Um, you know, other things require a little bit more, uh, like manual review, looking at, uh, you know, looking at responses and things like that in order to say, ooh, yeah, I, you know, I probably don't want that. You know, that's not telling me, uh, you know, that's not telling me specifically about a known vulnerability, but I don't necessarily want that information you know, from, from inside of the system. I don't want that data about this system leaking out to the, uh, to the, to the public. <clears throat> uh, another question for the behavior driven de de development and Terraform in the pipeline. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, you yeah, know, so uh, I, I like the idea of, you know, things like cucumber test to identify, uh, you know, to, to identify issues uh, in the pipeline where you can, where you, where, where you can, uh, you know, get that stuff in the pipeline. Like in, in general, I'm a huge fan of anything that you can get in the pipeline, uh, getting that into the, in, in, into the pipeline. Um, and the, the challenge there is that you need to know, like in the pipeline, there are different checks that you can do along the, at, at different stages in the pipeline. You know, for example, if you're doing, you know, some sort of like a code scanning or linting, you're typically not, uh, you know, you know we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but you know, you're typically not going to be able to get your full data flow or whatever analysis, but you can get the linting type of checks. Um, and they're starting to have that stuff available for your, uh, you know, infrastructure as code and things of that nature. Uh, and so I, I, I like those linting type checks. Um, you know, I, I would love a world where we could get full data flow and control flow analysis for your, you know, all of your code. 
um, you know, that typically the runtime is too great for getting into a pipeline. Uh, you know, and, and some things in the pipeline, you're only going to be able to get checks uh, after, you know, you, the whole system is built and assembled and it's spun up somewhere. Uh, and then you can start to do those uh, you know, types of, uh, uh, you know, those, uh, you know, you know uh, checks in actuality of well, this is what I thought I deployed. Did I actually deploy that? And so, um, you know, I love that uh, anything you can get in a CI CD pipeline, I love to see that stuff um, you know, because what it lets you know is every time I go through and, um, you know, every time I go through and run this, um, you know, I'm going to provision a system. You know, have I broken any of the assumptions that I have? from this system. Uh, and I'm trying to remember, I'm not sure if it's maintained as well anymore, um, but there was, a, uh, there was a, a really cool framework for those types. And I think it actually might have sat on top of Cucumber. Uh, let me, and that was uh, James Wicket that was the original developer of that, and the name of it is escaping me right now. Uh, but let me go, let me, uh, I'll also pull that, uh, pull, pull that as well uh, and, and include that in the show notes <clears throat> so that we can uh, send that out. I'm not sure if that is, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a, yeah, saying here, behave, it was behave, but it was, I thought it was a, uh, I will, I will, I will, I will track that down and get that in there because, uh, um, you yeah, that lets you do those types of checks to say, you know, like, Hey, I just provisioned a server are the assumptions that I would have about a server being held here. Right. Um, and, uh, so let me, uh, let me track that down and I cannot for the life of me, remember what that was, uh, James is on. Uh, I don't see James on, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, but I'll track that down. I get that. Uh, 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 I'll get that in there, and uh, <laughs> and thank you to Bruce Jenkins, uh, Bruce Jenkins, <laughs> uh, Videogenic. <laughs> thank you very much, and I'm glad that you guys appreciated. Uh, although I'm sure it's giving poor Carrie a heart attack. <laughs> um, well, great. Uh, so any other questions? Really appreciate everybody spending time with us today. Uh, again, the recording for this should go up here shortly. Uh, if you would like to review this or share it with any of your colleagues um, or for anybody, obviously, that did not have the opportunity to attend. Um, again, really appreciate you folks spending time with us. Hope everybody out there is doing well. We're all in uh, you know, kind of a weird, a weird and scary time, a lot of weird stuff going on. Uh, again, one thing that I'm very thankful for is that our industry being in the computer security space, a lot of the stuff that we can do can be done remote. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, my my colleagues you know, again at Denim Group. Um, you know, we've uh, we've been able to ride up the storm very well, and I think a lot of the other folks that I've communicated with in security have are in a situation where they can do a lot of their work remote. Uh, hope everybody is staying uh, safe and healthy out there. Uh, you all take care, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, you, you guys can tune in the next time.